This is the hour you've been waiting for. It's going to kick off with one of the most revered, respected geeks on planet Earth. But far more important, he is the leader and champion of Google in Europe. A very warm welcome for Matt Britton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm from Google, and I'm wearing a suit. Uh, these are strange days, aren't they? You've got to expect the unexpected. Um, so thank you for having me, uh, Paul, and thank you to all of you. It's been an amazing day. I'm going to touch on the theme of killer butterflies uh, a little bit later uh, as well, by coincidence. Um, so innovation and creativity and how they thrive under constraints. That's what I'm going to uh, talk about today. Backing the big tech trends to beat the turbulence that we all face. And if we stand at a moment of uncertainty now, we also stand at a moment of opportunity. And last week, I had the chance to spend a bit of time with uh, Dame Stephanie Shirley here. Uh, I don't know if you know her. She's a real hero of mine and for many of us at Google. Uh, she arrived in the UK in 1936 as uh, a child immigrant escaping Nazi Germany, an unaccompanied child. And in 1962, she launched her business against all the odds as a woman founder in programming and um, computer software. At a time when nobody bought computer software because it always came bundled with a machine. Not only that, she ran a company that was entirely staffed initially with women and nobody would take her seriously. She had to use the name Steve in order to get meetings with customers, um, but she made a tremendous success of her operation. This is uh, over 50 years ago now, and I think a huge example of a pioneering spirit and uh, thriving against a diversity that we can look to uh, today. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons we can learn from her story. Actually, in the background of that shot, smiling happily with glasses on, is Demis Hassabis, who's a colleague of mine, and started a business 48 years later in the UK, and it's still in the UK, it joined Google uh, a few years afterwards. It's called DeepMind, and it's one of the pioneers in today's uh, leading edge of computer science. And I'll come back to his story a little bit later as well. So she succeeded against the odds, and I want to talk a little bit about how we can take that spirit uh, forward today. Uh, we certainly live in times of disruption. That's been a little bit of a theme, hasn't it? Uh, we know that a rising proportion of the population in most Western economies believe that what life is worse today than it was 30 years ago, uh, that it's more dangerous, and that they're pessimistic about their future and their prospects. Whether it's because of the terrorist threat, ISIS, the war in Syria, Ukraine, whether it's because of natural disasters, climate change, whether it's because of political uncertainty, what's going to be the relationship between the UK and Europe, what will Europe be like without the UK? What's going to happen with President Trump? What's the role of Mr. Putin? What's the role of China in all of this? Each one concerning together and amplified by 24-hour instant media, it could lead you to the point of thinking maybe the best strategy here is to do nothing and wait and hope that this stuff goes away. And I would say that's exactly uh, the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do at these times is to look at the big trends that you can bet on with some certainty, the big trends that you can back and help you to beat the turbulence. And that's what I'm going to talk about in times when I think there's an opportunity for a real change in prosperity for everyone. So we step back and take the global view. We can separate the swirl from the big structural changes that are going on uh, in today's world, the changes that need all of our attention as, as leaders in business, trying to produce jobs and growth and prosperity. And borrowing from Johann Norberg and Matt Ridley, where, where we are today is a world where infant mortality and malnutrition, uh, poverty, child labor, and illiteracy are all falling faster than at any time in history, where the chances of encountering war or dying through a natural disaster are lower than they have ever been. These are huge positives, but I want to talk a bit more about some of the technology-driven structural trends that I think are important to us, since I know a bit more about them. So, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I understand the digital technology here is not great. So, I'm going to resort to good old-fashioned 
uh, manual technology, if I may, but can I just ask you, and I can see some of you already um, have the answer to this, how many of you uh, have got a connected device with you? Just stick your hand up and say yes. 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 Fantastic. Two devices, yes, yes. yes, yes. Wow. Three devices, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. Four devices. Is Martin Sorrell here? <laughs> no? But so look, we've probably got 2.4 devices on average uh, on each person in this room. And you know William Gibson uh, quote, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And I think the same is true now. So we're all used to the connected world. We've got these devices in our pockets, we've got these devices on our person, but actually the majority of the world have yet to get connected. We're in a world where we're the lucky minority. But what changes between now and 2020 is the internet population doubles. The connected world doubles. And when you have the internet in your pocket, you've got access to all the world's information, all the world's computing power, and everybody else in the world and all their ideas. And that is transformational. This is a phone that I bought in Kenya last year for $35. It runs Android, and it makes that kind of technology accessible so that a farmer in Kenya, a farm manager, can have access to the same information and tools as a fund manager in Canary Wharf. A pupil in Chennai can have access to the same information, tools, knowledge and connections as a professor in Cambridge. That's transformational. And it's not just about information, it's also about the tools and technology that those uh, things can, uh, can bring to you. Uh, here's an example of, of how Google's helping in some of those uh, tools. This is in Rio. And the eyes of the world were on Rio this summer. And it's a beautiful city, but 1.5 million people live in favelas. Uh, and they have no street address. And when you have no street address, it's very hard to get access to civil services, to apply for a job, uh, and to be treated as a fully class citizen. But what they have got is they've all got a smartphone. So we were able to work with local NGOs and local people with their phones to actually map on Google Maps uh, 26 of those communities and, and bring them online and bring them to that capability for the first time. Another example with the refugee crisis. Uh, we've seen huge spikes in the use of Google Translate between Arabic and German and other languages. And actually, Translate is getting better and better through advances in machine learning, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And I know you've heard about artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, throughout today. So these are all tools that are built for everyone, for the poorest person. It needs to work as well. If we're building a tool, it needs to be working as well for the poorest person as it does for the President of the United States. And let's hope they both use them. But in the context of those big trends, the trend of connectivity, the trend of information for everyone and tools that work for everyone, I want to turn and look a little bit more at Britain and the opportunities that we see if those are the big trends that we're facing. Now, here's a moment that I really enjoyed. I don't know about you. Remember this moment. Doesn't it seem a long time ago? The opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics, where we celebrated Britain's strength in innovation, the NHS, the Industrial Revolution, the Beatles, and this is Tim Berners-Lee baffling people um, by being, creating the World Wide Web in the center of the Olympic Stadium and inspiring a generation. And if you think about our history of innovation in every field, but particularly in computing, Charles, Charles Babbage's difference engine is in the Science Museum in London, having finally been built. Alan Turing, Dame Stephanie Shirley, Tim Berners-Lee, and now teams of people in London who are leading the world in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence. A huge history uh, of creativity uh, and, and innovation. And our universities are really becoming uh, centers of excellence globally in the field of machine learning. I talked about Demis Hassabis at the beginning, and you might have seen DeepMind in this context. Anybody see this in the summer? This is um, the team at DeepMind in London are trying to drive forward the field of machine learning. And they built a machine called AlphaGo to play the game of Go. And if you don't know the game of Go, it's very, very simple. Very simple rules, extremely complex strategies. There are many, many more board positions in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And so playing this game with a computer is something that people thought was going to be very hard to do. And they played uh, Grandmaster Lee Sedol, and they won four out of five games. And I like this photograph. This is a moment you may be able to see here. There's a board, and there's the technician from DeepMind who's placing the moves for the computer. And on the other side is an empty chair. And that's where Lee Sedol had gone to the bathroom for 15 minutes because AlphaGo had just played a move that he'd never seen before. And 
He paused for a second and said, well, what's that all about? He reflected after the series of games that in the 3,000-year history of Go, there were so many received wisdoms about strategies for playing the game. And actually, AlphaGo had made him think differently uh, and opened up new possibilities for him in thinking about this stuff. Well, you might say, well, that's great, but that's, that's a game. Are there practical applications uh, for this machine learning uh, technology? Well, I mentioned Google Translate. Last week, we launched a new version of Translate in a number of languages, which is a big leap forward uh, in terms of the quality of translation, the sophistication of the tool, again, available for everyone. We can uh, provide better answers with translate and voice recognition now from less data, which means it's cheaper for people uh, to access on lower cost devices with less data cost as well. In energy, uh, we've applied some of the machine learning technology to our own data centers where YouTube's hosted and where our web index uh, is housed, and we've managed to reduce the electrical costs of cooling by 40%. The DeepMind team in London is partnering with the NHS to investigate macular degeneration and whether uh, machine learning can help the optical identification of defects alongside medical experts to diagnose better and faster. So there's a range of things that are coming uh, through this kind of technology, and the UK really is in the forefront uh, of all of these things. And it's a collaborative field as well. It's a field in which research is published and shared so that people can progress. So the team at DeepMind have published three papers in Nature magazine, and at Google we've released tools and technology that any developer can build on using our own uh, lessons in machine learning so far. So it's an exciting and dynamic uh, new field. Britain's also increasingly great at technology startups. So this is campus, our building uh, near the Silicon Roundabout in London, which was open nearly, nearly five years ago now. And uh, we have one Google employee based there, Sarah Drinkwater. We have 7, 70,000 members of campus. And uh, the first day it opened, it was full of startups from top to bottom, bottom seven stories. So 70,000 members, 160 nationalities. Really important for us to be able to attract uh, the best possible people uh, to do these kinds of things. And um, they are... 40% female. So we're not quite where you'd want to be post Stephanie Shirley, but we're making some progress when people have those opportunities to access that, access that kind of uh, growth engine that is the, uh, the technology startup scene here. And they've created already between them close to 3,000 jobs and moving. So there's a really vibrant technology scene there, which we've been happy to play our part in and uh, to see grow. I promised you butterflies. So. Britain's great at culture, and this is an example of how. So with the Google Cultural Institute, we partner with a 1,000 institutions and museums and galleries across the world from 70 different countries, and we try to digitize, with their permission and in their control, we try to digitize their artifacts. And in this case, this is the Natural History Museum uh, in London, which is one of our biggest partners here in the UK, alongside the RSC and the British Museum and others. And so. Anybody with a smartphone can access the Arts and Culture app and explore the huge variety of Lepidoptera samples. So we could identify more accurately who's attacking our Prime Minister and uh, identify the right, uh, the right defences there. Uh, but again, this is British culture that everybody wants to access from all around the world, and it's now possible uh, for everyone uh, to do that. Anybody, anyone watching David Attenborough recently? What an amazing series, Planet Earth 2. And um, he's using technology, steady cams, drones, and image stabilization, and so on, which were, uh, was not available 10 years ago when he made the first version of, of the show. Um, well, one of the things uh, that I think is amazing about Sir David is not only he's an amazing storyteller about the natural world, obviously, we've all grown up um, inspired by that, but he's also a technology pioneer. So early with black and white documentary filming, straight in with color, uh, with 3D, with high definition, and with virtual reality, always looking to pioneer new ways of telling stories better. And Britain's also great uh, in the content industries, whether it's television, Doctor Who's already always gone through time and space across the world, Downton Abbey and some of our big shows are going everywhere, but also anybody with a smartphone can now also be a broadcaster, and we've got tremendous talent here uh, from all sectors. We now have over 200 channels on YouTube with over a million subscribers that are started and run from Britain. And whether it's book publishing, whether it's movies, whether it's music, whether it's journalism, uh, whether it's games, we have amazing content creation here in the UK. And there are going to be five billion people connected to the internet who want to access that culture, content, creativity. There's a huge opportunity for us if we look up and out at what's happening with those big trends 
uh, around the world. So make no mistake, the digital world is not about digital companies. It's not about technology companies. It's not about tech startups any more than the modern economy is about ele electricity companies. This is about every business. Every business is a digital business because every consumer is a digital consumer. She's got the entire internet in her pockets, and that changes everything. And, you know, in Britain, we're good at this stuff. The internet economy here is worth 12.4% of GDP, it's been estimated this year. It's the biggest digital economy in the G20. We're net exporters digitally. And we're a nation of digital uh, shopkeepers. Uh, and it's the small businesses, actually, that are showing the way. And I'll come back to, to why a little bit later. Uh, so this is Graham, uh, Graham Flanagan from Berwick Shellfish. You can imagine what they do. They sell shellfish, uh, not just retail, but also wholesale to eight different countries around the world. And a couple of years ago, our team helped them go online and do online marketing. And we know that businesses that are online are growing four to eight times faster, exporting more and creating more jobs, uh, exports, obviously, and prosperity. And uh, as a result of what they did online, they had to employ more people, and they were able to grow their sales faster. And what I think is interesting about this is for those of us of a certain age, when we grew up, the only companies in the world that could access global sales, marketing, distribution, and talents, the only companies that could afford the best technology were in the CBI. They were the multinationals. But actually today, anyone with a smartphone and an idea can become a micro-multinational. So the small businesses are often showing us the way uh, in this field, and Britain is good at this stuff too. So when you look at those big trends, Britain has incredible assets, I think. Innovation, culture, creativity, content, and commerce. And that's why at Google we're backing Britain in, in three ways. And you may have seen some of this uh, last week, because last week we announced plans for a million uh, square, square feet in three buildings in King's Cross with 3,000 uh, more jobs, right in the heart, actually, of the Knowledge Quarter, alongside the Crick Institute, the British Library, the University of the Arts, and the Guardian. It's a great place for us to be in the knowledge business. Um, and we're only successful in the UK because People want to use our products and services, and because businesses are more successful when they're spending money with us, it's because they're growing and exporting and getting a good return uh, on that. And uh, Deloitte, actually sponsoring here, have estimated that uh, over 11 billion pounds is generated for the British economy by small businesses and large businesses using our products and services. So we want to make a contribution, and we're here because we believe in the users and the talent and the businesses of the UK and what they're going to do in the future. But we also want to uh, inspire the next generation. Uh, this is uh, an example from last week. Our CEO, Sundar Pichai, visited uh, Argyle School in King's Cross. And uh, this is Google Cardboard, where you can put a smartphone in a small cardboard viewer. And in a classroom setting with expeditions, a teacher can control uh, what all the kids can see. So these kids were having a virtual reality experience. You can go anywhere in the world, but they had chosen to go to the International Space Station, just to follow the theme from earlier. It's a wonderful experience. And because we believe in trying to make technology that's accessible to everyone and that might inspire the next generation, who could come from anywhere, uh, we announced that we would make this experience available to a million children next year, free of charge in the UK, to see what they will make of it and to see their, where they will go with it. So we're investing in the UK. Uh, and we're also hoping to inspire the next generation, but we also think that there's more that we can do. Nearly 80% of the 5 million businesses in Britain believe that they could grow faster if they had better digital skills. And we've got a training program uh, that we've been running for a little while, and we've, we've gone to 80 different towns and cities across the UK and tried to help people gain digital skills online and through those training. And this week we're in Port Talbot and in Cardiff. Uh, 250,000 people trained so far. It's getting a step forward in online marketing, some of the tools that the shellfish guy and others have used. And that's, that's one of countless uh, hundreds of thousands of examples of businesses that are growing faster. Um, and so we've looked and we've listened and we've also learned from that more about how we can make this technology work for everyone. And so we uh, are going to try and make this digital skills tra training available at a much wider scale, not just for the small businesses, but for anyone who gets, wants to get the most out of the digital world, whether you're an individual who's curious or a business that wants to grow. And so 
in 2017, we're going to make five hours of digital skills training available to everyone in the UK, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever your starting point. And if you prefer to do that in person, uh, the, advice, the advice that you need and that matters will be in uh, 100 different towns and cities across the UK. We believe that digital skills can really make a dis difference to businesses, and that's what businesses, large and small, are telling us. We also need to connect with those people who feel marginalised uh, by the way the world's moving, and one of the ways to understand what they're doing uh, and to help them is to try to help them open up the opportunities of the digital world more. But do these digital skills really make a difference uh, to real, everyday businesses? Uh, well, this is um, Jonathan Blackburn, uh, who runs a business called The Houseman. Um, he's from Harrogate. He's an entrepreneur. He started this business in 2011 with 150 quid, and uh, it's basically doing home maintenance and repairs. And I saw him last week. I've met him a couple of times, actually. Um, and the business was going pretty well. Local repairs in Harrogate was, was doing well. And then he hit a rough patch and he had nearly two months without any new business coming through the door. And he was very worried that he was going to have to lay people off. Many of us have been through that kind of worry in the past. Uh, but he came along to one of our digital training sessions in Leeds and went home and he spent the night basically re rebuilding his online presence and his online marketing. And he saw immediate effect. And he now earns more in a month than he did in his entire first year of operations. And he told me last week, I'm an evangelist for all of this stuff. I try to get all the other small businesses near me to do this too, because I can see how much you can grow. And he's been able to increase the number of staff rather than reduce the number of staff. So that's the kind of example that we see in the hundreds of thousands across the UK. And there's plenty more opportunity for people to do more of this stuff. So what should you do in this context? I think as a larger organization, as we know, as you get larger, it becomes more complicated to move faster. And that's one of the challenges. I think the people who are showing us the way in this digital world are the everyday businesses, the small businesses like Jonathan's. And they're also the pure plays like companies like ASOS that are exporting and growing rapidly uh, online. But for all the rest of us, it's quite challenging to move uh, in the way that you need to, to keep up with this. And I think there are three things that I would advocate for everybody in the room to do, three strategies that you could adopt in this context. The first is to show up. If you really want to understand what's going on with people and technology, then you actually need to be in it personally. I encourage all of you to do that. Look at what the products and services that you sell and the business that you operate. Look at what's being said about it online. Look at what shows up uh, when you're online. Look at what your customers are seeing. Secondly, uh, to wise up, um, because there's a huge amount of data that's created. Every time somebody interacts with you digitally, that's an opportunity to make yourself smarter, smarter to test uh, and learn. And by wising up, you can understand what people are interested in. You know, when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, WWW, it stood for World Wide Web. Now you could argue it stands for what we want, when we want, where we want. And you need to understand what customers are looking for and how you can improve what you're offering them. And there's a wealth of data and tools that can help you with that, from Google Analytics uh, to something like this, which is TensorFlow, where we make our machine learning tools available to developers. Uh, Ocado, for example, are using this to help them route calls and information to their business better and smarter. Constantly experimenting using data with your prices, your marketing, your sales, your distribution can allow you to get instant feedback and improve the proposition in real time every day. It's a new way of working, but it's one that's harder for large companies to adopt uh, but it makes a lot of sense when you can improve daily your interaction with customers. And then finally, speeding up, because the pace of change is accelerating. Today is the slowest pace of change we're likely to experience in the rest of our careers. And uh, we need to move faster, particularly in the world of mobile, where people are more impatient than ever before. This is a nice tool that we built that's free for you to have a play with. If you've got a business, you want to see how your website performs, you can do this. Uh, go uh, just search for test my site on a search engine, and um, I, I had a quick look at uh, the CBI site, if I might, you know, just to check. And actually, the good news, Paul, uh, is that mobile friendly 98. That's a very, very good score. And actually, we give you free report and lots of recommendations on how to improve all, all these things. It means the site works really well on mobile phone, which is great. It's easy to scroll up and down and navigate, even with my fat fingers. Desktop speed is also really good, and that's often the case. We've built. Um, over 15, 20 years, desktop uh, sites to be really good, but the mobile speed could be improved. And actually, you're, you're not alone in this. 
but it's a real problem um, because we know that nearly half of people will leave your mobile site if it takes more than three seconds to load. More than three seconds, half of people are gone. So show up, wise up, and speed up. Have a look at that if you want to get some tips. Then you can ask your teams what the hell's going on. So if we look to the future, I mean, the main point of view I would have would be back the big trends uh, to beat the turbulence that we're in today. Uh, show up, wise up, and speed up as much as you're able. And I asked Dame Stephanie Shirley what her advice would be in this turbulence. And she looked, and with her years of experience doing what she'd done against that adversity, she, she simply said, what should we do in the face of all this, my friends? We should get on with it. So that's what we must do. Thank you. Good job, Mark. Thank you so much.